Okay, mobile connections. That's kind of like the the, the big one uh, when people start talking about HSS. Um, I mentioned pre-qualified moment connections. Um, there is this, uh, this book, if you will, called The Pre-Qualified Connections for Special and Intermediate Steel Moment Frames for Seismic Applications, or as we call it, 358. Um, that is basically a listing of connections that have been tested um, and pre-qualified, if you will, in accordance with the criteria that's set out in Chapter K. Unfortunately for HSS, there's really only one pre-qualified connection in 358, and that is uh, the ConnectTech ConXL connection. ConnectTech is a company out in California which has come up with this process of kind of creating these clamps that actually clamp on the outside. You can kind of see it uh, in this picture here. They actually weld onto the tube these little brackets, but then what that allows them to do is you actually bolt diagonally at 45 degrees and you actually are creating a clamping force um, that then helps develop uh, resistance to, to uh, and they've been fully tested for seismic loads. Um, it's unfortunate that we don't have more that are pre-qualified. Uh, that's something that Atlas is doing now. We're actually doing some, um, some thoughts on whether we want to get into the business of pre-qualifying connections. You know, or, or you know, looking at working with other people at pre-qualifying connections. What it boils down to is, you know, there is research that's being done on HSS to HSS connections at the University of Michigan. Uh, so we're, we're, we're a sponsor of that. We actually provide the tubes, and we're actually providing some oversight uh, to that. So, you know, there's a lot of stuff that's being done as far as HSS moment connections, but it's not in the code yet. It's not happening right now. But it, you know, there's stuff coming. In, in the future. When we talk about moment connections and you, you know, they say, well, gee, you know, there's, you know, there's only this one pre-qualified connection for moment connection and it's proprietary and I'm not a big fan of having to pay somebody else to, you know, do my designs for me. So how do you, how do you get around, you know, using HSS in, in their seismic force resisting systems? I said, well, I've done a little research and once again, this is, some of this is a little, I don't want to say nebulous, but it's a little fuzzy. Um, but there are some things that you can do to, to use HSS in, in seismic systems. And, you know, first one is to avoid using the seismic revisions. Sounds kind of sneaky, doesn't it? You know, just don't use them. Well, the reality is how do you not use them? Well, you use them by being in performance category A. If you're in performance category A, you don't need to, you're, to invoke 341. If you're in seismic performance category B or C and you're using R of less than 3, according to uh, ASCE 7, you don't need to be using the seismic provisions. So if you're in that world, which I think most of us probably are in that world here in Chicago, and you're using an hour of less than three, you do not need to use the seismic provisions. So therefore, you can use whatever connections you want. And that's one thing I think that people get lost and get a little fuzzy. They, they see the big world out in California, and they see all what goes out out there, and they say, oh, everything needs to be pre-qualified if I'm going to do a seismic. But you know, seismic is not a California problem. It's a national problem. I mean, I, mean, I don't know how many people have done projects in Philadelphia or New Jersey or, or the southern part of Illinois. I mean, you've got to deal with seismic, right? You've got to, you've got to do the detailing. Um, but a lot of times, you are in this world of A, B, or C in R less than three. And I mentioned this before, you know, from HSS to HSS moment connections, um, you know, the other option of, of using HSS is, you know, pre-qualify your connections. You know, if, you, if you're working for a project that has a lot of spare money and, you know, the owner really wants to go out and do something zoomy and new and, you know, he wants to fund you to pre-qualify your connections, go for it. Um, there is current research being done at University of Michigan, as I said, on HSS to HSS moment connections. All right, so now we're on the subject of moment connections. Um, let's say we are working in the world of, of where we can get away with not using pre-qualified or, you know, we're only controlled by wind, we're not in the seismic region. Um, so what, even, even then, HSS connections, you know, moment connections are a little, little scary for some people. So these next few slides are just kind of like some typical connections that I've come across that I, I'm exposing people to as saying these are just, these are pretty typical connections that are out there that just maybe you haven't been exposed to. If you're looking to develop continuity, I mean, the first one is, well, run your beam continuous. Uh, for a single story structure um, or at the top of a multi-story structure, if you need continuity in your roof beams or you're going to do cantilever construction, run it continuous. The caution here is that the bottom flange is not supported or the top of the column is not supported. So you do need to brace that. You do need to provide some stiffeners. You need to extend your joist uh, bottom cord in order to brace the top of the column. Otherwise, you know, otherwise, because most people say their unbraced length of their column is to the bottom of the beam, the reality is that unbraced length is actually to the support point. And so you actually do need to take it to where the support point is. But I don't think you want to try to develop any kind of continuity from your 
bolts to your beam there. Uh, so I would encourage you to brace the top of that column if you're going to do this type of connection. Now, it doesn't say you have to do it at the top of a building. You can do it at, um, at column splices. You can do it at every floor. It gets a little, you know, your fabricator may freak out a little bit, and the erection guys may freak out a little bit at this, but it is an option. Um, you can interrupt uh, each of your columns and run your beam continuous. For more lightly loaded columns, you can just run stiffener plates in there to transfer your, your axial loads. If you are using the full cross-sectional area of your HSS uh, for your column loads, you might want to think about splitting an HSS on either side and, and welding it to carry the load. Um, you know, these aren't the prettiest connections. They're not the most cost-effective, but it is a solution and it's something to think about. Um, you know, some, some detailing issues to think about. Uh, you know, if your beam, you need to have your beam finds wide enough to support the, the, the base plate. Uh, you may have to use a rectangular HSS in order to fit on the top of your beam. Um, and then the moment transfer that's associated with this is dependent on the pieces and parts that you use to this. So you have to make sure to check all that stuff. The next one is a through plate diaphragm. Um, and, and actually, I, I'll call it, I'll, I'll lump these together and, and diaphragm all together. Um, but one of the versions is, to, is a through plate. And this is where you would actually cut your column and then you actually run a plate continuous and you have to weld your column back together. Um, but it gives you a bolted connection. Um, you know, you can do them at column splices. You can kind of see in the one picture there, you can actually do it at a column splice. Um, the moment transfer is dependent on the welds you use. The alternative to that is uh, what we call a, a, a diaphragm plate that goes around the column. So you don't want to cut your column. It seems kind of, so you can have your diaphragm plate go around the column. So it's, it's, it's a very similar uh, situation, except now you're slipping your plates around the column and welding them. End plate. I haven't seen these used a lot, but they're still kind of an option out there where you can actually have either a plate welded to the face of the column and you bolt to it, or you could do angles welded to the side of, of each HSS and then bolt to that. It is wider than the column. It's going to interfere with finishes. It's going to you know, drive your architect nuts, but it, it, is, you know, it is an option. It's a, it's a good field bolt type connection. And then there's the old fashioned, just weld it up. You know, if you put, if you change that HSS picture to a wide flange, everyone would be really comfortable with that, right? That's what we do a lot of times. We just, we have a full, you know, full moment connection. And we weld it to the flange of the, the of the wide flange. But now, if we substitute an HSS there, everyone kind of freaks out a little bit and they don't know what to do. But the reality is, you can do this with an HSS column just as easily as you can with uh, a wide flange. But you have to realize some things. You're not going to be able to develop the full moment capacity, the full MP of your wide flange. So if you're looking at getting all the gas out of your beam, you're not going to get there. So it's not the right connection. Um, you can develop the full flexural capacity of the HSS. To maximize the efficiency of that, you want to make sure that your, your beam flange is as uh, wide as possible. You don't want to do, use a real narrow flange on a wide HSS. You want to maximize that, spread that load out, uh, make sure you're using all of the flat dimension of the HSS. Next one I want, the next few subjects are all related to truss connections. And um, because it's really, to be honest with you, this is really the most common connection out there that uh, people use HSS for. They use a lot of HSS uh, planar trusses. Um, the connections in Chapter K are related to uh, single plane uh, or planar trusses that are uh, typically designed uh, for pinned. You know, the, the pin members, the branch members are pinned. Um, you know, we're talking about tension and compression members. So those are the kind of connections we're talking about. And from a nomenclature point of view, this is what we're talking about. We've got a uh, few things I want to identify here is the G here. Um, that's what we refer to as our gap. So if we're talking about a gapped connection. And then E is our eccentricity. Now, a lot of times people think there is no eccentricity of these, but actually, depending on the dimensionality of your cord and your, and your branch members, there will be some eccentricity of the center lines. Um, and that does need to be accounted for. It's a secondary moment that does need to be accounted in the design of the cord. Um, and then, and then the overlap, if you're not, you know, we talk about gap connections, then we talk about overlap connections. And then overlap can either be 100% overlapped or partial overlapped. And that partiality is, you know, you can see there, it's a, it's a percentage of how much overlap there is. And when we're talking about overlap, this is what we're kind of talking about. 100% overlap is, as illustrated there, is the two branch members completely overlap. And then the partial overlap is where they partially overlap. And you can see that uh, there's, there's a, you know, definitely a more uh, different cuts and different profiling that's involved with a partial overlap. But there are some advantages to doing that. Now we'll touch on that a little bit. 
Now when it comes to analysis of these things, as soon as you pin the branch members, um, you can use the equations in chapter K for tension and compression. So that's what I encourage. You know, there, there's basically three ways you can analyze this truss. You know, everything's pinned, or you can do kind of the hybrid where you, you, you pin just the web members, just the branch members, and your cord is, is continuous. That's probably the, the better way of doing it because that, that reflects reality for the most part. Um, if you really want to model the eccentricity, the nodal eccentricity, as we talked about, you know, the, the E fact, the E value we taught in the nomenclature there, you can actually put in little stiff members and model your eccentricity that way. Um, you know, it's up to you whether how, how fancy you want to get with that. And then, of course, the third version is what this engineer was doing was with original analysis where everything's fixed. Now, you know, you, you may think that that's a better solution, but the reality is it makes it harder to design your connections. So I think either you, you know, pinning everything or, or actually looking at uh, a little more sophisticated model like the one in the middle there might be the better way of doing things. So when we talk about joint types, um, these are the different types of joints that are out there and are defined. Uh, we've got your T joints, which has a subset of Y. Uh, we have your cross joints using the nomenclature that's an AIC. In the European vernacular, they're called X joints. Uh, we have gap K joints and overlap K joints, and then within the subset of the K joint is, a, is something called N. Um, now, the thing I want to point out is these are, um, while it may look like these are all uh, dictated by the geometry, they're not. Okay? The geometry is really, uh, or the classification of these joints is really based on the method of force transfer. Okay, and that's important to realize because, you know, if you look at the geometry of a, of a connection, you think, okay, that's a K connection or that's a T connection. But the reality is it may be a combination of connections. So even though the geometry looks like a K connection, there may be a cross connection, there may be an N connection, and you have to be aware of that um, because it's really more about the force transfer. And what happens is that there are a lot of times, like, for instance, this case I've got illustrated here, this doesn't apply. This, this, if you look at this, it looks like a K connection. Actually, it looks like an N connection. That's what an N connection looks like, which is a subset of K. But if you look at it and you look through the formulas, this doesn't really, there's no formula that actually you can do that with. So what you need to do is you actually need to break it into the, the, the force transfer. In this case, 50% of the load is being transferred as a K connection, and then the other 50% of the load is being transferred as an X connection or a cross connection and you actually check what each one of those situations separately and then add them linearly. And then linearly together, the, the, you know, the interaction needs to be less than one. So it's, it's, it's a linear interpretation. So that's how you get around the limits of applicability within chapter K, is you have to look at the, the force transfer method and realize that it may be multiple methods of force transfer. Um, so you break it up into these different pieces and parts. So we're talking about trusses, we're talking about fabrication, I've talked about gap joints, partial overlap. You can see, you can see from the diagram that maybe partial overlap uh, connections, that, 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 that's a lot of cutting. My fabricator probably would freak out on that. So let's talk a little bit about fabrication costs and, and, and the impact that that will have on your decision on what kind of connections you do. You know, not only for truss design, but all steel design, minimum weight is not least cost. I mean, I think we've, we've had that message hammered into us a lot of times, but it's, it's true. Um, you know, sometimes by upsizing a few members, we actually lower our costs. Seems kind of counterintuitive, but it does, does happen. Um, obviously for a truss, if we keep the number of different sizes to a minimum, we're gonna, you know, be better off. So, you know, having every single branch member be a different size as you go across your moment diagram for your truss, maybe it makes sense to group things a little bit and, and, and or make them all the same size, depending on how adventurous you wanna be. And then the clear thing here that I want everyone to walk away with is understanding the joint configuration and the connection design criteria before you analyze that truss, before you select your members. You really have to do that. We live in a part of the country, part of the world, where we tend to push off the connection design onto our fabricators. Um, it's a system that works, it's good, um, but a lot of times we tend to ignore the connections because, well, I'm not doing them, why should I worry about it, right? So what happens is we design our truss, we come up with least weight, we have all the forces in there, we hand them off to the, we put them on a uh, diagram in the, in the drawings and maybe we amplify them by 10% just to cover ourselves and then we hand it off to the fabricator and he can't get the connections to work. And I need to put reinforcing plates in and I do this place, I need to add this, that and the other thing to get these connections to work. A little forethought by the engineer on the front end of this, 
understanding that if you upsize the cord size a little bit, you can avoid, you can get your connections to work, you can avoid a lot of reinforcing issues that may have to happen at the fabrication level. So it's just something to be aware of that you really, in these type of situations when you're looking at a welded truss, you really need to understand the connection configuration and the joint and the, and the capacity of those joints. So along those lines, what this chart will show you is for different configurations, um, you have different costs. So there, while there is a, a cost impact for each one of these, there's also a strength impact that goes that's opposite of this. So you know, as you get up in, in, in strength, or as you, you know, there is cost associated with it. So it's just something you have to find that balance for your project. Just jumping back here a second, okay, we talked about you know, what, the, what the cord is, but I didn't really talk about what the branch member is. Well, if you look through the limits of backability uh, in, in Design Guide 24 and Chapter K, you'll see that it's really, uh, they only deal with like to like. It's either round to round or square and rectangular to square and rectangular. That's what everything is. But so what happens if you have the situation where you want to have round branch members and square cords? And especially if you do like a, ca a gapped connection, that still seems like a pretty simple connection. You know, you know one, one planer cut, uh, welded up, and you know, maybe I like the, the aesthetics of having the round uh, branch members. But the problem is, is this doesn't really, isn't really covered by Chapter K. It's outside the limits of applicability. But of course, in, 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 if you look in the commentary, there is language in there that says you can use other verified design guidance. And so therefore, we need to look what, what other verified design guidance is out there. Um, there has been research done by, uh, you know, once again, Jeff Packer's name is up there, Professor Packer. He's, uh, he's involved in a lot of stuff when it comes to HSFs. But he wrote a paper a few years ago uh, about the static and fatigue design of these types of connections using what we call a conversion method. And what this basically does is for calculation purposes, you convert the round sections into square sections or equivalent square sections. And so therefore, once you do that, you can then use the Chapter K requirements. And the formula that they've come up with there is if you take the, the branch diameter of D and you replace it with a width of pi over 4 times D and the same wall thickness, you can then use the Chapter K requirements. I made a lot of references to a lot of different things. And I thought I'd just you know, quickly show them a collection of these resources out there because a lot of people, they've heard them before, but they really don't know what they are. Well, clearly Chapter K, that's in the specification. That's, that's one of the greatest resources that we can have out there about HSS connections because you know, right now we have something in the spec that tells us how to do connections for HSS. You know, prior, to, prior to 2005, they didn't exist. Uh, design Guide 24 um, is the AIC design guide that's based on Chapter K, uh, for the 2005 version of Chapter K. Um, it, it's a great resource. I highly encourage you, if you haven't seen it, to, to, to check it out. Um, Professor Packer, once again, our, our friend from the north in Canada, has designed, he has a design guide from back in 97, which was really good about this, this issue, was with, especially with trust connections and HSS connections. Um, it's, a, it's a bit out of date from a code perspective, but it's an excellent resource. And then, of course, the CDEC Design Guide. CDEC is a European organization uh, that produced, does a lot of education and research about tubular structures. It's actually a collection of uh, tubular manufacturers that promote uh, education and research, and they do a lot of research uh, programs. And they publish nine design guides, and those are available for free on AIC's website. So you don't have to go to CDEC to order them. You can actually go and download the PDFs right off of AIC's website. Um, you end up with a pretty good sized PDF, but it's still it's a free document. And um, while they're Eurocode centric, they still have some, uh, all the information that's in them uh, is based on, is the, the core information that was then put into Chapter K. So while Chapter K is a little limited, sometimes the CDEC uh, is an expanded version of that. So they're a great resource if you want to go beyond what's in our codes. And then we're trying to, on our websites, we're trying to you know, help you guys out by giving you resources as well. Um, and we're constantly going to be improving that, so I encourage you to check out our websites. Threw a lot at you in that hour. Um, hopefully it was meaningful to some of you. Um, hopefully you had some, it, a lot of, there's, there's a lot of things in there that I'm sure people will have debates about. For, <laughs> and I'm sure I'll get uh, pummeled with lots of little email questions after this, but uh, it, a lot of it's food for thought. So it's just things to think about. It's things that maybe you haven't thought about before when it comes to HSS connections. So, and I appreciate your feedback.